We continue with some of the other advances just to go back. You would have seen Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister, two people, again, you've read about in Destiny of the Republic. You've got William James and some of the stuff that he's doing with psychology. Um, you have Library of Congress that is beginning to bring out literature and making it more available. In addition to all those changes, you also have a new form of journalism. That would be yellow journalism. And it would be focused on sex scandals, anything that would sell newspapers. And notorious was this guy here, Joseph Pulitzer, who was one of the New York newspapermen. And uh, he would sensationalize these ads and these stories just to sell the papers. The other biggie in that would be uh, William Randolph Hearst and... Um, to counteract those sensational stories, the Associated Press was to help kind of figure out what the true essence was. Not only do you have the newspapers battling it out, you also have authors and their stories that they've chosen to write on. In some of the examples here, Henry George, Progress in Poverty, and uh, most notably Edward Bellamy with this book called Looking Backward. And here it is here. This whole story was based on somebody being woken up in 200 years later, 100 years later, in the year 2000 actually, and looking at what a wonderful utopian world it was, and just amazed by the, um, the world he, he woke up in. However, when you looked more at that world, it was actually the same as in 1880, and it was wrought with con uh, corruption, with reaping profits off of the working man. In reality, nothing had changed. Though very interesting with some of the um, things that he thinks about as far as what was going to be in the future and his accuracy in that. So an interesting individual. You'll see here some of the other authors of the period. we got the Lewis Wallace, Ben-Hur, Horatio Alger, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, um, who became famous after her death when her poems got released. Uh, Mark Twain is going to uh, also be in this period. He coins that term Gilded Age, if you recall. Um, so some other notable authors here. Not all of them do you need to know, but again, another one that stands out is Frank Norris and the Octopus, talking about all the arms of businesses and how they were reaching out and um, corrupting the system. So that was kind of what focused his story. In addition, you find here that the females are active in this period as well. And we know that because we go back towards the previous chapter with the Gibson girl, and this being Dana Gibson. You'll notice here the slender physique, um, that that's what came to typify the females. They wanted that. They were looking for it. It was a way to go, get away from that old dress that was large, bulky, and now this was more form-fitting. And that's going to raise a lot of conversation about sexuality um, and roles of females. And we see that here, for example, <clears throat> in certain uh, stories or newspapers where they would write about exposés of affairs. We have reactions about the immoralness that's happening there, the new morality, if you will, the new sexual freedom, increased birth control. Margaret Sanger will be a big part of that later on, although with the purpose of eugenics, not... Um, about <clears throat> uh, sexual deviances. Um, but nonetheless, the conver uh, conversation about families and women are really evolving in this period. And we see here some, ag some examples again. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Woman in Economics, talking about going out into the working world, breaking out of those traditional boundaries uh, that were you know, secluding them at the home or <clears throat> preventing them from getting out of the home. And it is also a period where they want to focus on getting more rights, being more active. And that's where you see the NAWSA, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Carrie Chapman, all famous female uh, individuals who would help gain them those rights later on. And it's not just white women. We also have Ida Tarbell, <clears throat> otherwise known as Ida B. Wells, and the Nas National Association of Colored Women. Here is a... A uh, little picture of, of her, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law, 
It's all in its phases. She would write about these stories, showcasing the problems that were happening in the country, and actually showcase more than just social issues. She talked about the Standard Oil Company and the corruption that they had and helped to bring them down, um, helped the government uh, break up the Standard Oil Company. So a good example, in addition, much like they had earlier in the 1830s, they talk about prohibition and the ills of drinking, Women's Christian Temperance Union, Francis Willard, Carrie Nation, both presidents at one point of that organization. Um, she sees herself, by the way, Carrie Nation I'm referring to, sees herself as the axe for God. She's going to uh, really be you know, physical in her effort of uh, getting prohibition achieved. So that's where you see the Anti-Saloon League. <clears throat> in addition to prohibition, you know, let's take the American Red Cross as an example. Claire Burton is going to um, help provide the impetus for that. And it's all about cleanly, healthy environments, much like what um, Joseph Lister had talked about earlier. We've got to create sanitary environments. <clears throat> Now, it does look like there's a lot of people that you need to know, and there are, but we need to make sure we focus on the most important ones. So, for example, in this here, we have artistic triumphs, and there's a lot of people that are on this you know, small little paragraph, and uh, not many of them are going to make the AP exam. Of course, Thomas Edison and uh, somebody we've already come to know in other lights would be one such example. Uh, in this light. But also, if we look about the business of amusement, now that people are um, benefited by industrialization because it actually reduces the amount of time that they have to work, as far as uh, the middle class is concerned, they can go out and, and enjoy more of the luxuries. And one of those would be the Barnum and Bailey Circus, uh, the greatest show on earth. If you ever watched it, it's actually kind of cool. You've also got Buffalo Bill and uh, Annie Oakley with the Wild West shows, working with... Um, Chief Joseph, or is it uh, Sitting Bull, who would reenact all the Native American uh, American ex uh, events in that 1800 period, showcasing the talents of Annie Oakley, being able to be a markswoman, um, showcasing Custer's Last Stand, to whatever it was. Um, but again, in another form of recreation, you've got the basketball, other sport activities starting to gain momentum. So think about those examples here in this chapter and connecting it to the previous chapters where we looked at the industrialization and all the other economic factors that were playing in that period. Now we're looking at more of the social factors and the roles that people are going to be taking and some of the consequences of those industrializations uh, on the way people lived back then. So uh, definitely a very active time period. Uh, very involved. And remember, at the same token, there are a lot of things happening out west. The Dawes Act, talking about interactions with Native Americans. How are we going to handle that issue? So, um, so much happening. And it's also the beginning stages of imperialism. We've taken over Alaska from the Civil War. Well, next we're going to go into Hawaii. Well, then we're going to get involved in the Spanish-American War. And then we're going to get involved in Panama. And then we're going to get involved in World War One. I. I mean, it's continuing. And that is taking... Uh, place all at the same time as these events here, although most of them will find more momentum in that early 1900 period, but this is when they get their foundation. So keep that in mind. <clears throat>